All right, perfect. Well, welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you today for our League of Women Voters speaker series. Today, we will be talking about the complications of pregnancy and abortion and the medical and societal consequences of the legislative criminalization of abortion. Our talk today is being recorded, but I want to note that after Dr. Brum finishes up her presentation, we'll turn off the recording for our discussion as a group. So that will not be uploaded on YouTube um, and it will not be recorded. Our featured speaker today is Dr. Connie Brum, who is a retired family physician and I should say board member of the League of Women Voters. She practiced on the Palouse from 1983 until 1992, and then in Bellevue, Washington from 1992 to 2016. Her emphasis throughout her career is to provide information to her patients so that they could make informed choices about their medical care throughout their lives, including birth and death. She believes that information and choice is the key to quality health care and quality of life. She joined the League of Women Voters of Moscow in 2016 when she returned to the Palouse to celebrate her retirement. She's currently working with several organizations in guiding clients with end of life planning. So without further ado, Dr. Connie Brum. see me because I'm going to perch on this stool to keep myself comfortable. Thank you all for coming. Hello. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. We do not support partisan candidates or political parties, but we do take positions on certain issues, particularly voting rights, education, and health care. The League of Women Voters position on health care, as posted on the national website, is Every U.S. resident should have access to affordable, quality health care, including birth control and the privacy to make reproductive choices. There is no equality without reproductive rights. I was asked to speak about pregnancy and abortion. Obviously, that's a huge topic that cannot be reduced to 45 minutes. I'm not going to address the Supreme Court decisions or the legal aspects because I'm not a lawyer. And rather than a didactic lecture with charts and slides, this is gonna be more like a stream of consciousness of issues and aspects that I care about most. I plan to leave at least 20 minutes for questions about what you wanna talk about rather than what I wanna talk about. To quote myself in a recent letter to the editor, pregnancy is not a happy-go-lucky condition that always ends with a healthy baby and an unscathed mother. So I thought I'd explain why I said that. I'll start with pregnancy. Pregnancy is not a positive pregnancy test. It's not binary. It's a condition with a continuum of a series of events. To go back to eighth grade biology, first an egg must be fertilized by a sperm at the right time and in the right place. 23 chromosomes from each need to line up. The fertilized egg needs to land and grow in a nurturing uterus. And over a period of about 280 days, a whole lot of things need to go right. Second, I'd like to define abortion. The word abortion in medical terminology simply means termination of pregnancy. Medically, there are four different abortions. Spontaneous abortion is when a pregnancy ends on its own euphemistically called a miscarriage. Elective abortion is when pregnancy is ended through the use of medication or a procedure. Incomplete abortion is when after either of the above, products of conception are still present in the uterus. Missed abortion is when the fetus has died but no signs of spontaneous abortion have occurred. I'd like to familiarize you with the many things that can go wrong. This is by no means a complete list, nor can I go into great detail for every one example, or we would be here all day. Let's start with the embryo. 23 normal chromosomes from the egg and from the sperm need to line up. This doesn't always happen. 
To a large degree, that's the reason that 20%, one in five of all pregnancies spontaneously abort. About half of those are due to chromosome abnormalities. There are also chromosome abnormalities that don't spontaneously abort. And I'm gonna lump these into three categories. <coughs> the first category is extra chromosomes or trisomies. This is when two of one particular chromosome instead of one comes from either the sperm or the egg totaling up to three. Trisomy 21 is called Down syndrome. Trisomy 18 is called Edwards syndrome, and 90% of those die before birth. Trisomy 13 is called Patel syndrome. Most do not live past a week. Then you can also get um, either two X's and a Y or three X's because there's an extra X chromosome coming from somewhere. An XXY is called Klinefelter syndrome. Three X's is called triple X syndrome and an X without the other X or Y is called Turner syndrome. All of these syndromes have varying degrees of anatomical and developmental abnormalities. The second category is metabolic diseases. These are some of the ones that cause brain damage and organ damage. PKU, or phenylketonuria, is a buildup of phenylalanine. Maple syrup urine disease, where the body is unable to process amino acids. Tay-Sachs disease, which is a neurodegenerative disease that is always fatal. Neiman-Pick disease, where the fetus is unable to metabolize fat. Wilson's disease, which is an excess copper accumulation in the brain and liver. And sickle cell disease, where the red blood cells are abnormally shaped and unable to transport oxygen to the body. All of these diseases can cause varying degrees of organ and brain damage. The third category is anatomical abnormalities. Some of these are incompatible with life. Some of these require major surgery at birth for survival. Anencephaly, which is the absence of a brain. Renal agenesis, which is the absence of kidneys. Hypoplastic left heart, when the left ventricle and the aorta are so small that they're unable to pump blood adequately to the rest of the body. Transposition of the great vessels, when the aorta and the pulmonary artery are switched so that the blood is going in the wrong direction. Tetralogy of Fallot, which is four major cardiac defects. Spina bifida where the spinal cord does not develop normally and can even be located outside of the body. Omphalocele, where the abdominal organs are outside of the body. Cleft lip and palate, that can be so severe, a hole in the roof of the mouth that the fetus is, on, or that the infant is unable to feed. And tracheoesophageal fistula, where the breathing tube and the swallowing tube are connected and there's a hole between them so that food and air are going in the wrong direction. Any of these abnormalities, chromosomal, metabolic, or anatomic, might be a legitimate or necessary reason to have an abortion. Next, I'd like to mention some of the complications of pregnancy for the pregnant woman. Ectopic pregnancy, which is when the fertilized egg implants and grows outside of the uterus, usually in the fallopian tube, it can rupture and cause rapid bleeding and death. Incomplete abortion, when products of conception remain in the uterus and if left untreated, can lead to infection and bleeding and death. Or a molar pregnancy, also called a hydatidiform mole which is when placental tissue runs amok like a cancer and can become cancerous. There is no viable fetus. The life-saving treatment required to prevent death in these three cases is to terminate the pregnancy, technically to perform an abortion. Some other complications of pregnancy that can lead to life-threatening situations or long-term illness Hyperemesis gravidarum, or uncontrolled vomiting. Gestational diabetes, 
which may not be reversible and can almost always lead to an enlarged infant, making birth, childbirth more difficult. PIH, or pregnancy-induced hypertension, also known as preeclampsia, which can, if left untreated, can lead to seizures and death. HELP syndrome, H-E-L-L-P, uh, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets, which if left untreated can lead to stroke, bleeding, seizures, and death. Placenta previa, where the placenta is low in the uterus, blocking the birth canal. Abruptio placenta, where the, uh, where the placenta tears away from the uterus, cutting off the blood supply to the fetus. Premature rupture of membranes, where the amniotic sac ruptures prematurely, leading to infection, probably to a premature birth, and depending on how premature, can be somewhat catastrophic for the infant. And multiple embryos, twins, triplets, or more. Those increase the probability of all of these other complications that I've mentioned by even a higher amount. If performing an abortion is the medically appropriate and indicated procedure in a situation at the same and at the same time is illegal with penalties of fines, losing their license, and or going to jail, doctors will hesitate or refuse and women will die. Children will lose their mothers, families will lose their wives, their sisters, and their daughters. There's currently a 33-year-old pregnant woman in Florida who went to her ultrasound at 23 weeks. It was discovered that the fetus had no kidneys, a poorly developed heart or stomach, and almost no amniotic fluid. This is called Potter's syndrome. When this baby is born, it will live only 20 minutes or perhaps up to two hours. After reviewing the options, the couple decided on a preterm induction as soon as possible out of concern for her physical and mental well-being. Their four-year-old thought he was gonna have a sister. The doctors and the hospital all agreed that terminating the pregnancy was the right and compassionate thing to do, but they refused because of the Florida law. The Florida law does not clearly explain how viability should be interpreted. The combination of a narrow exception to the law and harsh penalties for violating it terrifies physicians. In Florida, they can lose their licenses, face steep fines, and face up to five years in prison. This woman has had to endure three months of being pregnant with a fetus that she knows will die before anyone is willing to help her. She cannot travel to another state. She has no money. And her husband just got a job after being laid off during COVID. She said, quote, it makes me angry for politicians to decide what's best for my health. We would do anything to have a normal baby. Recently, there was a editorial in the Idaho Capital Sun by Dr. Kylie Cooper in Boise, who is a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And her letter is so perfect that I can't possibly say any better what she said. So please indulge me, I'm gonna read you her letter. <clears throat> a couple suffers the loss of her unborn baby and are sent to me for help. In the clinic room, the emotional pain is palpable. As a maternal fetal medicine special phys physician, I'm here to help them through this unimaginable circumstance. At the end of our time together, they're hopeful for another child someday. They tell me that in a future pregnancy, they hope I can care for them because they trust me and feel safe. Sadly, when they are pregnant again, I will no longer be here. I am leaving Idaho because of the abortion bans. I came to work to Idaho. I came to Idaho to work as a maternal fetal medicine physician, someone who cares for the most complicated pregnancies. I was excited and optimistic to use my expertise to make an impact in the lives of others and to improve reproductive health care and pregnancy outcomes in the state. I made Idaho my home, but then the abortion bans took effect. These laws have impacted the management of pregnancy complications and lowered the standard of care. My life as a physician has been turned upside down. 
How do I keep my patients safe? How do I stay safe? The total abortion ban does not have exceptions, only affirmative defenses. An affirmative defense means that the burden of proof lies with the physician to prove their innocence. In court, the physician must prove that the procedure was necessary to avert death or was due to rape or incest. There is no defense to protect the health of the mother, which is the most common scenario we face. I need to be able to protect my patients' lives, their health, and their future fertility without fear of becoming a felon. This fear is why I'm leaving Idaho. Idaho's maternal and infant health is worsening. Mothers are dying at an increasing rate. A lack of physicians and access to care are major contributors. These bans make it difficult to attract physicians to the state. The loss of health care providers due to the criminalization of medicine will only further these health disparities. These factors made my decision to leave an immensely difficult one, but I cannot continue to practice in a place where I do not feel safe. I wish lawmakers could spend a day in my shoes, see the things that I see, deliver the news that I have to deliver, touch the hands that I hold. If they did, they would have an appreciation of the difficult choices that people and their physicians must make. These laws are making recruiting new physicians much more difficult. Another story just last week on Wyoming Public Radio was an interview with two women who grew up in Wyoming, went to medical school, most likely through the Wawame program, and are doing residencies in OBGYN out of state. I believe one in California and one in Washington, I'm not certain. They were both planning to come back to Wyoming to practice. One was going to even have up to $300,000 of tuition paid back if she practiced in Wyoming for three years. But she took a job in Montana and the other woman took a job in Georgia. The criminalization of abortion creates a wall preventing them from making decisions in the best interests of their patients. And they both say they feel the laws can make them choose between playing with their licenses and going to jail or watching a woman die. That's an unacceptable risk, and they're choosing to go and practice elsewhere. The C-section rate in the United States is 26% overall. In some states, it's as high as 30, it's over 30%. An ideal C-section rate, however, has been determined to be around 10 to 15%. It's well known that C-sections carry a higher risk to com of complications than vaginal births. There are approximately 700 pregnancy-related deaths in the United States every year. The most common causes of these are heart disease, stroke, cardiomyopathy, which is a weakening of the heart muscle, amniotic fluid embolism, where amniotic fluid gets into the bloodstream, travels to the brain, and causes a catastrophic stroke, severe bleeding, and severe infection. I'd like to compare the case fatality rate of live births versus legal abortions. In 2020, the case fatality rate was 23.8 deaths per 100,000 live births and 0.43 deaths per 100,000 legal abortions, which basically translates to it's 50 times more likely that you will die from giving birth than from having a legal abortion. Pregnancy is risky. Fortunately, no mothers have died in my care in my career, but one came very close. The baby was normal and healthy in spite of the placenta being very abnormal and unhealthy. Once the baby was delivered by C-section, the placenta, which was glued to the inside of the uterus, caused a catastrophic clotting abnormality and the patient was bleeding out on the table. The only way she was going to survive was to remove the uterus. The obstetrician, who was a good doctor and a good man, was also a Catholic, and he could not bring himself to sacrifice the uterus, in spite of two specialists on the phone telling him it was the only option. I had to go out into the hall and get permission from her husband before 
he would proceed. I tell this story to make two points. One, to emphasize that pregnancy is not without risk. Unpredictable, catastrophic things can and do happen. The other is that religious beliefs, political beliefs, threat of lawsuit, and now threat of prosecution can cloud the judgment of qualified, capable, and well-meaning physicians. It's reasonable for a woman to feel compelled to avoid the risks of pregnancy. It's unconscionable for a government or any other entity to force a woman to take on those risks. I'd like to give a brief historical perspective on abortion. Abortion's been with us for centuries. It didn't just become a thing in 1973. Throughout early history, women and midwives have induced and performed abortions. In the late 1800s, doctors, almost all men, began medicalizing childbirth and abortion. Abortion first became criminalized in 1880 and by 1910 was illegal throughout the United States, which sent the practice underground. In 1930, 2,700 women died from illegal abortion. In the 1960s, there were so many birth defects from the use of thalidomide and from rubella infections or German measles infections that women were clamoring for what was then called a therapeutic abortion. Also in the 1960s, every hospital in the country had a ward or a bed that was reserved and used for complications of illegal abortion. In the several years before 1973, there were approximately 800,000 illegal abortions per year. Currently, there are approximately 800,000 legal abortions per year. As access to legal abortion increased, the morbidity and mortality of abortion decreased eightfold. In 1963, there were 200 and 80 deaths from abortion. In 1965, there were 235 deaths. In 1972, when abortion was legal in five states, there were 35 deaths. And in 1973, there were 19 deaths. All of these events have increased support for legal abortion and are some of the reasons why 80% of Americans think some abortion should be legal. 62% of Americans say abortion should be legal in all or most cases, and 37% say abor of Americans say abortion should be illegal in all or most cases. I think Bill Clinton said it well. Abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. So who seeks abortion? Approximately half of all pregnancies are unintended. One in four women in America have had at least one abortion in their lifetime. Of the women who seek abortions, 97% are adults, 49% are living below the poverty level, 59% already have children, and 55% are experiencing a disruptive life event, such as losing a job, a home, or a partner. There have been societal consequences to legalizing abortion. Legalization has had profound effects on women's economic and social lives and has also impacted their circumstances into which children are born. Legalization has reduced the number of unwanted children. Legalization has reduced the number of cases of child neglect and abuse. Legalization has reduced the number of children living in poverty. Not that it's all that great yet. Legalization has increased the likelihood of children eventually attending college. And legalization has reduced the likelihood of children living in poverty and receiving public assistance in their lifetime. I recently read about an interesting study of 700 women who had come to a clinic for a pregnancy test. Half were in red states, half were in blue states. When they were offered a hypothetical medication to bring on a period, a so-called period pill, which doesn't exist, by the way. 40% said that they would prefer that to having a pregnancy test to find out if they were pregnant. Of those who said they did not want to be pregnant, 70% said they would prefer the period pill to a pregnancy test. 
In today's political climate, ambiguity could be useful. <laughs> I'd like to say a few words about adoption. Adoption can be an alternative to parenthood, but it is far from being a panacea. Many women who relinquish babies experience chronic, unresolved grief. This is the reason so few women choose abort adoption when faced with unwanted pregnancies. One study in 2017 found that only 14% of women who were denied an abortion were even considering adoption one week later. Birth mothers take on medical risk, social punishment, and years of silence and secret keeping. Adopted children, even ones raised in loving families, continue to have feelings of, who am I? Where did I come from? How did I come to be adopted? Some studies have found that losing a child to relinquishment produces feelings similar to losing a child to death. We all view abortion through a different lens. Some view it as a sin, and I support them. Some view it as a sacrament, similar to birth and death, and I support them. Just as no two births are alike and no two deaths are alike, no two abortions are alike. The circumstances of each abortion are different. Some people even define abortion differently for themselves depending on the circumstances. A good example is this story. Recently, Eric Swalwell was interviewing Catherine Foster from Americans United for Life during a congressional hearing. And he asked her about the case of the 10-year-old in Ohio who was raped and pregnant and had to go to Indiana for an abortion because abortion was illegal in Ohio. And she said this, would a 10 year old choose to carry a baby? It would impact her life and so therefore it would fall under any exception and it would not be an abortion. <laughs> so basically she said that this abortion was not an abortion because of the circumstances. That's when I realized we weren't all using the same language and that it was important to try to define the terms and clarify what we're actually talking about. One more story. It's happening right now in Texas. It was published by NPR recently. A woman with one very small child at eight weeks during her second pregnancy was having hyperemesis gravidarum, uncontrolled vomiting. She had an ultrasound which discovered a twin pregnancy, which would explain why she was feeling so bad because that's a common complication of a twin pregnancy. At 13 weeks, it was discovered on ultrasound that baby B most likely had trisomy 18. 90% of trisomy 18 babies die before birth and the rest only live a few days. Every day, baby B puts baby A and the mother at greater risk of complications. She was told that in New York, doctors would do a selective fetal reduction, but that in Texas, you can't do that now because now almost all abortions in Texas are illegal. She felt that the laws were preventing her doctor and her genetic counselor from even telling her about her options. Quote, she says, nowadays with the way we got this bounty hunter system in Texas, doctors are gonna err on the side of caution. At 14 weeks, she saw a maternal fetal medicine specialist. He was more honest, which in a way was a relief. He said, this baby is not going to make it to birth. You can't do anything in Texas, and I can't tell you anything further in Texas, but you need to get out of state. She says, we knew baby B was not viable, so we needed to look at what to do to protect his twin and myself, and we knew we had to act fast because of how sick I was. They found a doctor in Colorado and at 15 weeks went to Colorado. A single needle was injected into baby B. Both fetuses will stay in the uterus for the rest of the pregnancy. One grows, one doesn't. The woman immediately felt better with less nausea and was so relieved that no more decisions needed to be made. Then at 16 weeks, back in Texas, her family and her doctors, who all knew what happened, continued talking in code. Fear about the abortion laws lingered. All they would say was, well, it appears that baby B has passed. At 35 weeks, currently she's still pregnant and doing well, at least last I heard. 
She says, overall, I've been so overwhelmed by just anger and how much additional stress we've had to go through. There was also the additional cost of $3,000 to travel to Colorado. She's acutely aware that most people can't drop that much money on a short notice. But offsetting her anger is relief that she was able to get the abortion and that she only lost one of her twins and that she's still pregnant. So here is a woman who had not one, not two, but three complications of pregnancy. She had a twin pregnancy, she had hyperemesis as a result of that, and she had a fetus that with a, a condition that was incompatible with life. And the best possible outcome could only be obtained by aborting the non-viable fetus. And yet Texas legislators would have prevented her from doing so. Abortion will always be part of the human condition. It cannot be legislated away. Whether you believe abortion is right or wrong, some of the time, all of the time, or never, will always be up for discussion. It's worthy of debate. But that debate belongs in homes and families and places of worship and in doctor's offices and perhaps even in the public square. But it does not belong in the halls of government. Criminalization of abortion will only bring harm to women, children, and society at large. My final thought is this. Abortion is health care. In order to be a physician, one must complete a very specific and lengthy education and pass multiple tests to get a license to practice medicine. Legislators who are passing laws about what medical procedures can and cannot be performed are practicing medicine without a license. I'll take your questions.